I come to you today bringing greetings in the precious name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and I want to thank you for the invitation to just even bring the word today. And, and I'm not going to ask permission because I was taught long ago in one of the churches I was at, the pastor doesn't ask permission to preach the whole counsel of the word of God, but I want to inform you that I'm going to preach the whole counsel of the word of God. So I'm not going to shrink back. So I may be longer than what you've become accustomed to. I'm certainly going to probably be more energetic than what you're accustomed to because it's who I am. But what I want to share with you today is that I have a rhema word for you. This is something that I, I you know, I, I don't, I, I've never repeated a message that I can remember, certainly not intentionally. Uh, and, and in every setting I ask God, God, what do you have for this people gathered together? And so what I think I have for Jeffrey Assembly of God today is the key to entering into what God has for this church. Because I know that there's been a, a journey that you've been on, and you've been now uh, holding the fort down, if you will, for these many months. But I want to talk to you today from the Old Testament. I know I was talking to Peter before, and he said he's kind of been dwelling in the book of Ephesians. It's a great place to dwell. But I think that uh, we have a question to ask ourselves is, do we want all that God has for us, or do we want a little bit of God mixed in with what we want? And that's an important question for us to settle as we move into this. So we're going to be in the book of Judges. Don't know the last time you opened up the book of Judges and actually started to look here for a word for today. Sounds so Old Testament, right? I mean, like, that's Old Covenant. It's, it's one of those periods where Israel was Israel. You know, they were, they were stuck. They were in rebellion. They didn't do things the Lord's way. But, you know, the, the whole counsel of the Word of God is worthy to consider because it's all his word. It's the full revelation of who he is. So we're going to be in Judges chapter 1. And I'm not going to read all of chapter 1 because we're going to be in Judges chapter 1, verses 1 through Judges chapter 2, verse 15. So it's a lengthy section of scripture that we're going to look at today. But what I want to say to you is that as we glean from the word of God, I'm going to keep bringing us back because we're going to, we're going to use this as the foundation piece. And we're going to springboard off of this into other periods that kind of set a background for us. Because we're coming in this book here, in the first and second chapter, we're coming to the end of Joshua's life. You remember who Joshua is, right? Joshua is the one who actually led the people of God into the promised land. Joshua is the one who took the mantle from Moses and, and helped them cross the river. And Joshua going all the way back, and we're going to look at this momentarily, he and Caleb were among the 12 spies that God sent out to spy the promised land of Canaan, right? And they're the ones that were faithful and believed God. But they wandered with Israel for 40 years because Israel didn't believe God. And so Joshua has led the people of God into the promises of God, and now he's coming to the end of his life. And we're going to see that they're back in that same place of missing the mark of missing the promises of God. And as the people of God, we get really stuck in our own ways. And, 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 and being stuck in our own ways prohibits us from experiencing the fullness of what God has for us. So what I want us to do is to, to understand that we're not called to be people that are stuck. We're called to be people who march victoriously into the promises of God. God, for example, in the, in, the, in the days of Moses, said to the people, I have given you the land. Church, Jaffe, somebody of God needs to hear that word today. God's given you the land. Well, then you might be wondering, then how can we struggle so much? Well, let's see if we can glean some things, amen? Let's take a look at the word of God today. So let's go first, keep your you know, bookmark or whatever in, John, in Judges. Let's go back to the book of Numbers, because that's where some of the story begins. You heard my wife's response to judges and to numbers. For her, numbers is worse than worse than judges, even probably. Yeah. But but there's so much of the history that we need to understand in order to move into the things that God had. So Numbers chapter 13. We're going to begin in Numbers chapter 13, and we're going to start reading in. Let me just see in terms of the context where I want to begin. But let's just begin in verse 20. Um, Six. No, no, sorry. Actually, I need to begin in verse 25 just so you can see some things. Numbers 13, verse 25. Everyone there? Okay. So we're going to read some verses here, and then I'm going, to, I'm going to take it apart for you and unpack this. So beginning in verse 25, it says, And they, 
who's the day? The 12 spies, okay? One from each of the tribes of Israel was sent out, and they returned from spying out the land after 40 days. So they didn't kind of come in and take a casual glance. They spent some time really looking at the, at the territory that they were to take. They, they looked around at what God said, I've given to, this to you. And, and so many times what happens with us as the people of God is we just kind of casually look at the word, we casually look at the promises, we casually look at the condition, and then we try to make an evaluation based on that and wonder why that doesn't work out. They took 40 days. So I want you to see that because that's going to be significant. So obviously, uh, 12 is significant in the, in the biblical numerology. 40 is significant in biblical numerology. There's no accidents with God. Right? So 40 days, they spied out the land. It said they departed and came back to Moses and Aaron and all the congregation of the children of Israel in the wilderness of Paran and Kadesh. They brought back word to them, to all the congregation, and showed them the fruit of the land. Then they told him and said, We went to the land where you sent us. It truly flows with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. Isn't that an awesome beginning? Like, yeah, the land is beautiful. Look at what God's given to us. It flows with milk and honey, and here's the fruit of the land. Like, you think, okay, they're, they're going to get this. Like, because they, they've seen, God said, I've given you this land. It's flowing with milk and honey. And remember, when you've been in exile, when you've been in the barrenness for a long time, land flowing with milk and honey is really a wonderful promise, isn't it? A wonderful deliverance. God delivering this to the people. He said, here is the, the fruit, and the land does indeed flow with milk and honey. So we went to the land where you sent us, and it flows with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. Nevertheless, the people who dwell in the land are strong. The cities are fortified and very large. Moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south. The Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites dwell in the mountains. The Canaanites dwell by the sea along the banks of the Jordan. Then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, Let's go up at once and take possession, for we are well able to overcome it. Now, now that's such a conflicting report for what we see in this initial thing. Have you ever looked at the circumstances of your life and thought it's just too great? Yes. Mm -hmm. It's just too great. Yep. Now remember the context that we're looking at. God has said to this people, I have given you the land. Listen, the scripture says you're more than conquerors through Christ Jesus who loves you. More than conquerors. Your circumstances might be great, but God has already declared some things about you. Which are you going to believe? The circumstances which you're looking at in the natural? Or that which God has declared to you in the spirit? For he is spirit, and he desires those who worship him to worship him in spirit and in truth, not in their circumstances. We are to worship him from the midst of our circumstances, but not because of our circumstances. We worship him in spirit and in truth. God's given you the land. But we looked at the circumstances. The way I like to summarize this session is this is what the, 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 the ten came back with. The walls are well fortified, the people are ready to fight. And they're a giant people. Huge, bigger than our army both in stature and in size, numbers. You ever felt overwhelmed in your life? Uh -huh. Has it ever caused you to be paralyzed? Uh -huh. Has it ever caused you to miss what God had because you were so afraid of what going into that would bring yep. that you just went, yeah, no. Yep. <laughs> because it seemed too daunting yes. to enter into. Well, every believer has those kinds of circumstances in their life, and we have a choice. Every one of us has a choice. See, God has given us a choice. It's both a blessing and a curse. The blessing is he doesn't force us into anything. The curse is he's given us a choice. Yeah, because yes. what happens more often than not is we choose wrongly. Wrong Remember when Joshua stood up elsewhere in the scripture, and it's in the book of Joshua, and he said, Choose this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my house, we will we'll serve. serve the Lord. So Jeffrey is somebody of God, to those of you that are gathered here today, including the guests, who will you serve? Which report will you believe? Because the, the circumstances were the same. Joshua and Caleb were in the land for 40 days too. They saw the giants. They saw the well-fortified walls. They saw that the people were ready to fight, that the armies were assembled. But they came back, and this is what Caleb said. He said, let's go up at once and take possession. Like, he wasn't afraid of the circumstance because he knew God was on their side. God had given them a promise that he held on to and believed God. But so many times what we do is we... We, we let the circumstances dictate the outflow of our life. 
don't let the circumstances rob you of the promises of God. Your circumstances are not truth. God is truth. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. He's the truth. We live in a world that is passing away. He dwells in eternity. His word is established in heaven forever. His word is established. It's already a fact. It's, it's eternal. And it will not pass away. But this world will pass away. Your circumstances change day to day. Sometimes it takes 10 or 12 years, but it, they change. Right? The circumstances change. Stop believing the circumstances. Caleb says, let's go up at once and take possession. But the men who had gone up with him said, we're not able to go up against the people, for they're, they're stronger than we are. Oh, my goodness. This is what we do. We give more power to those who oppose us than we do to the God who we serve, who is over all. We do. We can't take them, but God can it might even be that which the New Testament says, that with man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Right, right. Do you believe him? Do you, do you understand what he wants to do for you? Because he is able, he's more than able to accomplish that which concerns you. More than able. The key is going to be found as we continue through the story looking at this, right? We're not able to go up there strong enough yet. Who cares? God is on your side. The battle is not... Oh, I forgot to shut up my phone. <laughs> yeah, pass it, pass it. better pass, be God. better be God. You can leave your own God. Doing good. <laughs> the battle is not yours. The battle belongs to the Lord. So you get time to come up and play that, right? Yeah. We have a neon who will enter the land. God all belongs to the Lord. Right? The weapon that's fashioned against us will stand. God all belongs to the Lord. We sing glory and honor, power and strength. We sing glory and honor. The battle is the Lord. We sing glory and honor. We worship Him in the face of the adversary. We worship Him in spite of the circumstances. We worship Him because He's worthy in all times to be worshipped. when we enter the land, or when we do like Israel. We're not able to go up. They gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land which they had spied out, saying, The land through which we have gone as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people we saw there, whom we saw, they're giants. They're of great stature. We saw giants in the land, and we're like grasshoppers in our own sight, so we were in, in their sight. Who cares what you see? Look what God wants to, to do. He takes the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. You might be a grasshopper in the face of your circumstances, but is God able to do what he says he will do? Is God not God? When did he cease being God? Is God a man that he should lie? Well, he said, I've given you the land. But we can't do it because we're like grasshoppers in our own sight. Never mind in these giants. But God's up in heaven going, yeah, but they're just grasshoppers too. Right from God's perspective, the obstacle is no obstacle at all because he's so much greater than that which we look at that's so giant. But to God, there's nothing there. We need to ask God, give us your perspective on these circumstances. Joshua and Caleb had the perspective, but the people became afraid. We let fear bind us up and we don't enter into the promise of God because we're afraid. That's right, that's right. Look at the obstacle, it's too great for us. Church, can I just say, stop doing that? Oh, I hate that when you say that. Don't do that. It's, it's not good. We miss the promises of God. I know. When we let fear dictate the outflow of our life. Fear is not of God. That's true. New Testament says the perfect love casts out all fear. So you know it's not of God. If, if, if love, and he is love, if perfect love casts it out, anytime fear comes in, it's not of God, so you can rebuke it. You have authority in him to rebuke fear. This is not of God. I rebuke you in Jesus' name. Get me behind me. I am not bound again with a bondage to, to fear. But I've been given the spirit of adoption, son and daughtership. I'm a child of the living God. Will we enter? Flip over to Numbers 33. 
30, 40 days they wandered around. Joshua and Caleb were the only ones that, that believed God. And, and you know, they saw the same things. They didn't deny that the, that the giants were there. They didn't deny that the walls were well fortified. They didn't deny that the people were ready to fight. But they just said, let's go take it. God's given it to us. But we don't live in denial. We live in victory. There's a difference. Are we a victorious people or are we not? So in Numbers chapter 33, verses 50 to 53, we're going to take you deeper than just believing God. I'm going to show you some principles in the Word of God that prohibit us from entering into the promises of God. Now the Lord spoke to Moses in the plains of Moab by the Jordan across from Jericho, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, say to them, When you have crossed the Jordan into the land of Canaan, then you shall drive out all the inhabitants of the land from before you, destroy all their engraved stones, destroy all their molded images, demolish all their high places. Then you shall dispossess the inhabitants of the land, and you shall dwell in it, for I have given you the land to possess. You know what? Before I go any further with this, happens, we like to look from a distance at other people's lives and go, isn't God good? Look what he did for them. And we don't possess it for ourselves. We, uh, we admire it from a distance. God said, go in, drive all this stuff out, get rid of every idol, get rid of all of that stuff, drive that all out, and then dwell in it and take possession of it. Own it for yourself. Stop waiting for the pastor to say it. Stop waiting for your brother or sister to, to give you a testimony. Enter into the promises and possess it for your own. Amen. Because if you don't possess it, it's not yours. Does that make sense? Like even in the natural, right? If we don't possess it, it's not our own. So we can watch others possess it. And, and envy is what creeps in with that. Oh, I wish God would do that for me. Well, he wants to. Will you believe it? Will you enter in? Will you drive out what needs to be driven out? Will you possess that land? Or will you just watch from a distance? God's clear. Did God stumble in, this, in these three verses that I read? Did he stutter? Did he misdirect? Did he change his mind? No. Did he speak this and then say, no, later I was only kidding? No. Right? Did he pull the rug out from underneath <laughs> them and say, I didn't really intend for you to actually ever possess it. I just wanted to see if you believe me. No. This is the, God, the word of God for the people of God. He said, go and do. And he expects us to go and do as the people of God. Right? But what happens is we won't do the driving out or the possessing. Because the driving out might cost us something. You ever have things in your life that God said, I want that out of your life, but it has an attachment in your heart? Yes. And you, and you hold on to that thing because to get rid of it, would, would cost us, whether it's emotional or physical or sometimes costly, you know. I, I know the story, this is a true story, of a man who, before he got saved, had bought a bunch of material to open up an adult store. I'll just leave it at that with the little ones here. Got saved and thought, well, he's going to find something to do with this material, so he's going to find other adult purveyors of stuff and, and try to sell it to them because he paid a lot of money for them. Good decision, bad decision. What do you think? Bad decision. Right? I mean, that's obvious. But what about the stuff in our life that we hold on to that we that we that we think cost us something? And yes. God says, "I want that removed." And yes. you go, "Yeah, but 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 I'm attached, or it cost yes. me, or, or, or you know, it has even has it it has a memory attached to it back here. It doesn't mean it's God, but it's a memory we have, and, and we go, I can't release it. Yes. And God says, yeah, "That's going to prohibit you. It's going to prohibit you." Ouch. Deuteronomy one eight. Don't you love this Old Testament? This, is, this sounds like it should be New Testament stuff, doesn't it? This is our Old Testament stuff we're looking at. The people of God. 1 8. Deuteronomy 1 8. Here it is again. I just I want to reiterate this. So, see, I've set before, I have set the land before you. Go in, possess the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give them and their descendants after them. Listen. God has promised, and what he wants us to do is to possess the promises. That's the instruction. That's all that is. Right? We're talking about the land of Canaan, I know that. But I'm talking about now as we as modern day saints, people of God, who are no longer looking to possess the, the, the chosen land, if you will, the promised land. But, but we need, God has made some promises and he says, go and possess it. Go and possess it. 
Can you believe God for that? And then not only believe Him, can you do it? Can you, can you own the promises? Now, I'm leaving some stuff out because I'm building to something, but I just want you to see, God's not, He said, I promised it to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob. This is something that long ago was established, and I want you to own it. Go, I've said it before you. It's right there. Yeah, I think it is that isn't part of our frustration is that we can like see and taste it. It's like right there, but it feels like that proverbial carrot. We feel like we're always chasing it. God said, I've said it before you. Now go and possess it. Go and take ownership. Go and move into the promises. So I don't know what your needs are specific, each of you individually, or the church as a total. But what I'm saying to you is, God doesn't hold out a carrot and chase you around, have you chasing around in a circle. He says, go, possess it, move into it, and, and take ownership of it. I'm going to slap this lady's in my face. I'm used to a bigger space. <laughs> Deuteronomy 121, because this is a word for you today. This is a word for us today. This is a word for the saints of God today. Deuteronomy 121, so he says, I've said it before you, go and possess it. And then he says in 121, he says this, because see, we put chapter and verse, and we think that because there's a subtitle before we start a section of scripture, this must have something to do totally with something else. Don't be deceived. Read the context of scripture in totality. He's still speaking. I set the land before you, Go and possess it. And then he says this in 21. Look, the Lord your God has set the land before you. Go up and possess it. As the Lord, uh, God of your fathers, has spoken to you, do not fear and don't be discouraged. Have you ever grown discouraged? Uh-huh. Waiting for the promises to come to pass? Uh-huh. Have you ever let fear keep you from uh -huh. taking ownership of them? Uh-huh. Don't be afraid. And don't be discouraged. The discouragement that we experience is, is, is of the enemy. It's one of his greatest weapons to keep us from moving into the promises of God. When Nehemiah built the wall of Jerusalem, remember some of that story? He went into the city, he prayed, he fasted, he wept, he sat down and mourned. He walked around, he asked God for a strategy. They started to unfold the strategy and three men arose. And one of the biggest weapons those men used at the beginning of the project was to discourage them. They mocked them. They ridiculed them. You believe in God? Come on, look at the walls. They're in ruins. I mean, you can't rebuild this. There's nothing left to rebuild. Ever feel that way, Jeffrey? As somebody again? Has anyone ever kind of whispered that into your mind? Like, we can't rebuild this. There's nothing but ruins left here. What I'm saying to you today is that's not the truth. It's not from God. We need to move into the promises. We need to possess it. We need to not be afraid. And we need to not be discouraged. All right? So, Joshua 18.3. Notice we're getting back to the book of Judges as we progress forward. Joshua 18.3. Now, what I want you to understand about the context before I read this verse. The people have moved into the land, but they haven't taken possession of the land. So, so for us, for us, sometimes we will kind of straddle the fence as the saying goes, mm -hmm. or, or partially move towards, but not possess. Look at 18.3. Joshua said to the children of Israel, now if you read the book of Joshua, they've already crossed the Jordan, okay? They've crossed it, they've entered in. But entering in is different than possessing. Right, they've entered into the land. Jeff, you something of God, how long have you been here? Roughly. Someone give me a history. How long have you been? 30 years? So we, we're, we're in the land. We're in the land. Fairly well established. But have we possessed it? Okay? Have we possessed it? How long will you neglect to go and possess the land which the Lord your God, the Lord God of your fathers has given you? How long will you neglect I'm going to read you some definitions. <coughs> Different translations use words other than neglect. Yes. And I read through as many as I could find and was mortified by what this word means because we think of neglect and we, we know it's bad, but it's kind of eh, neglect. Not so bad. It's not as bad as abuse, right? If a child is neglected, it's not as, well, at least they weren't abused. Or, but listen to some of the words, right? To neglect, the other translations use the word slack. How long will you slack? How long will you put off? How long will you delay? 
How long will you avoid? How long will you show yourself slack? Not only that you're slack, but you're showing your character, you're revealing your character. How long will you reveal the character that you don't really believe God at all, slacker? Right? Why do you wait to possess what God's already given you? Which shows a, 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 a measure of distrust. I don't really believe God for it. I'm not trusting Him for what I need. I'm not trusting Him for the promises. And then, because I don't trust Him, I don't what? The next step is, is worse than not trusting Him. If I don't trust Him, I'm not going to obey Him, and I won't take ownership of it for myself. Because what if I take ownership and it doesn't work out the way that it says? Well, that's not trusting the Lord. Right? How long will you waste time conquering, one translation says. So you, you, you face an obstacle, you kind of conquer the enemy, but then never possess the promise. Isn't that a waste of time? You conquer the enemy, but never possess the promise. We do it all the time. Right. Right? We, 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 we seem to get victory because our circumstances change, and, and somehow you know we think, well, I conquered the enemy, it's God, but you haven't possessed the promise. There's a whole different realm in possessing the promise. God wants us to walk in the, the realm of the Spirit, not just in our circumstances. <laughs> I'll try to remember. How long are you going to wait? How long will you be negligent to possess the promise? This is all from God's perspective. How long will you be negligent to possess it? Stop walking in your doubt and your unbelief. Stop walking in fear and discouragement. Stop walking in letting the circumstances dictate the outflow of your life. How long will you be negligent to possess the promise of God? How long will you sit around on your hands? There's a good one. Right? How long will you put off taking steps? See, so some of the problem for us as the people of God is this. We say mentally, we make a mental assessment. I believe God promises these things. I believe God's given us the land. I believe God, it's not for you only because it's written. It's not for you only because it's written. Remember, I had to tell these ladies that the sermon was written before I spoke to them this week. Yeah. How long will you put off possessing the promise of healing? How long will you put off possessing the promise of provision? How long will you put off, okay, taking steps towards owning those promises for yourself, for your life, for the things that you face? How long will you put off taking steps? Don't make mental ascent. Show your faith by walking it out. James said faith without works is dead. Walk it out in faith. Walk it out. How long will you put off steps, taking steps? And then this other one here, the last one. How long will you wallow through sloth? Oh. A lot of churches are wallowing in sloth. Mm. It's not very complimentary. But, but I didn't make these up. I didn't even take it like from a you know Merriam-Webster dictionary. These are translations of the Word of God with the Hebrew word defined in its fullness. So it shows us what it means to neglect taking possession. Church, let's not be the people who neglect to possess the promises. Amen? Let's not be those people. Let's not be those people. Let that not be our testimony. Because if we don't do that which it says in the Word of God, we need to drive out and to possess. And I'm gonna and I'm gonna come back to the drive out because we're gonna look at judges in a few moments really kind of deep with that. Listen. In 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 21, we're not even going to really look at it because I got distracted in my study and I went, oh, wow. But it's the prophet battle. You remember that? Elijah on, the Car on Mount Carmel, and, you know, right? He asked the people of God, he says, how long will you waver? I'm just going to read these. I'm not going to emphasize anything. I'm just going to read it because I wrote it down in, in terms of, this is what waver, scripture translation means. To halt, to limp, to hesitate, to hobble back and forth, to jump from one side to another, to not decide, to have it both ways, to not make up your minds, to try to serve both, to sit on the fence, to straddle the issue, to remain paralyzed by indecision. Ever been there? Right? Oh, to yeah. falter and to be divided between two ways of thinking. The Bible I read says that if we're double-minded, all right, we're unstable and we can expect to receive nothing from the Lord. How long will you waver between two decisions? Either God is God or He's not. How long will we waver before we believe Him? Before we enter in? Alright. 
Let's go up to Judges. Are we good? Yeah, sure. Do you hate me yet? No. No, you're all right? All right. Some days. Some days. <laughs> Only my wife. No, others have told me the same. Oh, okay. No, they have. They have. <laughs> they have. We have a witness here. Oh. All right. It wasn't. No, it wasn't. We're going to do highlights of chapter 1, verse 1 through okay. chapter 2, verse 15. But before I look at the highlights, I want to give you something. 2003, 2004, I was walking through a period of brokenness in my life. It was something that God was unpacking in my life. My brothers and sisters in the back row there walked through this with me. And in this period of brokenness, tremendous brokenness, God gave me a list of words. He gave me these six words. And I'll read the six words to you, but then I'm going to talk about the two words that specifically are for Jeffrey and Assembly of God. Because it supplies for us. He gave me the word confession, obliteration, devotion, diversion, obsession, and possession. In order to have the purity of the word of God come to fruition in our life, these were the words that God had given me. And for our sake, I want to focus on the word obliteration and possession. 2003, 2004, God gave me this. I still have these words tacked to the bulletin board next to my desk in my office. The battle plan for purity. Because I don't think that God changes his mind, right? So obliteration, what God spoke to my heart about the word obliteration is literally everything must go. Everything that's not of him must go. Everything. You have some stuff in your life that's not of God, you know it. You know it's the, the things you watch, the things you listen to, the things you read, the conversations that you have, the possessions that you own, you know, all of that kind of stuff. You have anything that you know, just, it doesn't belong to God. It doesn't honor him, it doesn't glorify, it doesn't serve in the purpose of serving him, it doesn't, it doesn't benefit the kingdom at all, but it, it just makes us feel good because it's attached to some memory or some experience in our life and we hold on to that and we, you know, we still like that music that we listen to in the world and we still dress like we did back then and, you know, it's not of God. It's not of God. Everything must go. It's not of Him. In order to walk into the fullness of what God has for us, everything that doesn't belong to Him, everything must go. The problem with Israel if I took you from, from this whole story and, and read through all of Numbers and all of Deuteronomy and all of Joshua and all of Judges, the problem is they kept some of these things for themselves. Yeah, they didn't tear down the high places, among other things. Everything must go. And, and not only that, but we're going to look at it in a minute. And then the last thing is they didn't really possess the land. And that's, that's part of the problem as well. So the problem in the, in the text of 1, 1 to 2.15 is that they didn't obey God and wiping out everything. Now, for, for many people, I've had this conversation even recently with my dear wife. This doesn't sound like the God of the New Testament. Why would he tell us to wipe out the people? Like, just obliterate them. Doesn't sound like God, except for here's the problem. It's purity. And a little leaven spoils the whole loaf. And we keep just a little bit of what was in the world in our life, and it spoils the purity of the Word of God and the work of God in our life because it spreads in our heart. It, it attaches to our life, and we, and we have unclean things that are in our life. That's an open door legally in the heavenly realm for the contract for the enemy to have access to your life. The enemy has access when we keep those things in our life. They've got to go. But we don't want to because we think, well, what's the big deal about what I listen to? Or what I watch? I'll give you a free one. This isn't even in my note. Or what I play or what I say. Six things the Lord detests. Seven things are an abomination oh, to him. Yeah. And the list goes down. And the seventh thing is this. He who shows discord among the brethren. That's, that's an abomination to God. We like to point out the sinful lifestyle of other people. I'm not even going to speak it because you all know. And call it an abomination. We judge them. But in the meantime, we shred the pastor or the leadership of the church or the brother or sister that we you know, fought with last week that sits in the pew next to us. We show discord among the brethren. That's an abomination to God. It needs to go. Stop doing that. But we hold on to it because we think, well, what's the big deal? Well, because the power of the tongue holds blessings and curses, life and death, and the power of the tongue. God spoke and everything that was came to be, except for man, which he formed, but then he breathed into him the breath of life. The power of the spoken words to produce life. 
to bring forth both for good and for evil. But we hold on to these things. Yeah, we do. We don't obliterate it. You're correct. And we justify it. Yes, we do. So we never experience the fullness of what God has for us because we don't possess the land fully because we haven't dispossessed everything that needs That's to go. That's right. That's right. That's right. All right? Everything needs to go. Now, before somebody in their mind thinks, well, he's preaching Old Testament to us, right? You know, what's the, we're New Testament people where people embrace love, love, love. That's all it's about. Well, that's what the liberal left is saying too, right? Love, love, love. Well, everything must, you know, that's not possessing the promises at all. Let me bring you to Matthew. Before I go on a little bit more, chapter 12, three verses in Matthew. Then we'll come back to Judges to finish up. Matthew chapter 12, 43, 44, 45. context of this, the, the Pharisees are demanding a sign. Jesus has some harsh words to them. But then he teaches them a principle, a principle that applies still today. This is a New Testament principle. New Testament principle. Everyone say that. New Testament principle. New, New Testament, Testament principle. Principles of, of the Word of God work whether you believe them or not. I'm just, I'm just, I want to establish that fact. And this is New Covenant. Okay? We agree Matthew's in the New Testament? Yes. Therefore, part of the New Covenant? Yeah. Okay. Let's look at 43... 44 and 45. When an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places seeking rest and finds none. Now, I'm going to teach you for a moment. Spirits, angels, and demons, right? They're real. And do we, are we all in agreement with that? Yes. We can all stand in agreement with that. So, unclean spirits need a host in order to manifest and do what they do on the face of the earth. And, and sometimes what happens is, even unwillingly, we become a host. I'm not talking about possession, but just a host. Okay? An unclean spirit goes from dry places, seeking rest, and finds none, because he doesn't have a host. Then he says, I'll return to my house from which I came. And when he, find, when he comes, he finds it empty, swept, and put in order. This is the believer. We're, we're, we're now we're empty of, of, of possession of the demonic influence. We've been swept clean. We've been washed by the blood. We love to sing that, right? Right? But now we're, listen, empty, swept, and put in order. The problem is empty. Because once you've swept your life, obliterated everything that's not of God, you need to fill it with the things of God. You can't just sweep the house clean. Because here's the principle. Then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they shall enter and dwell there. Listen, they're doing the very thing we're supposed to do. We have the promise of God now. You yourselves are the temple of his Holy Spirit, the place where God dwells. And, and he says that the enemy comes in and he returns sevenfold, and he dwells in you. He's now possessing you, and what's the problem is we're supposed to possess the promise. Our life is now in ruins. All right? He says that he yes. comes and he takes seven more wicked than himself. They enter and they dwell there. And the last state of the man is worse than the first. So shall it be also with this wicked generation. Let it not be of us. Let it not be of us. New Testament principle. Say it again. New Testament principle. New Testament right? principle. The New Testament principle is we must possess or be once again defeated, plundered, and or destroyed. That's the principle. We must possess or we will be defeated, plundered, and or destroyed. John 10.10, 10, right? The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. All right. Judges chapter 1. We'll speed up now from here. No, we will, because this is this is a lump of stuff that I want to make some points on, and then we're going to look at a couple last uh, sections of this. Judges chapter 1, verse 19 says this. So the Lord was with Judah, and they drove out the mountaineers, but they couldn't drive out the inhabitants of the lowland because they had chariots of iron. Didn't drive out, couldn't drive out. Observe that, right? Chapter 1, verse 21. But the children of Benjamin didn't drive out the Jebusites who inhabited Jerusalem. So the Jebusites dwelt with the children of Benjamin in Jerusalem to this day. Chapter 1, verse 27. Verse 27, 
it says, however, Manasseh did not drive out the inhabitants of Beth Sheen in its villages, or Tanakh in its villages, or the inhabitants of Dor in its villages, or the inhabitants of Ibleem in its villages, or the inhabitants of Megiddo, by the way, where the final battle will take place, in its villages, for the Canaanites were determined to dwell in that land. Can I tell you that the enemy wants to stay in your life? He's determined to bring you to ruin. You need to drive them out. Don't let them dwell there. But the problem is we let them dwell there. Verse 28 gives us even a greater sense of what happens. And it came to pass when Israel was strong, oh, here's a danger when we get strong. Mm -hmm. We rely on our own way. Mm -hmm. That they put the Canaanites under tribute. Now not only did they defeat the enemy, they just put them under tribute. Do you know what being under tribute means? Anybody know what being under tribute means? Enslaved, slave, but it means more than enslaved. They were allowed to remain, though enslaved. They were allowed to remain, and though enslaved. You know what? I don't know what the people of Israel thought. They, maybe they thought like we do. Well, why do we have to, you know, destroy the people? I mean, they're people too. There's some good people there. You probably knew some good people back in the bar, right? When you were in the world. Bring me some people that you think were good people. If I had some stuff back here that you thought was good stuff, why does it have to go? Because God said so, because it's impure and it's going to ruin your life. And, and then you think, well, I'll just make it my servant. I'll enslave it and I'll have mastery over it. No, no, no. You think so, but no. Because they're going to infiltrate from within because you've given them permission and the leaven's going to spoil the whole loaf. <coughs> Everything has to go. And the problem with us is we want to leave it. And then we can read 29 through 33, which I'll just read, and I made my points here, and then I'll finish up here. Nor did Ephraim drive out the Canaanites, nor dwell who dwelt in Gezer. So the Canaanites dwelt in Gezer among them. Nor did Zebulon drive out the inhabitants. Hey, you know what I've noticed? These are the people that didn't believe God in the first place. These are the tribes. It said, well, fortified, <laughs> giants, I can't do it because they're ready to fight. Let's not go in. Then they went in, and they didn't know better. They didn't drive out, and they didn't possess. Be careful about that place of unbelief because it'll bite you. Be careful. It always comes back. Always. Zebulon didn't drive out the inhabitants of Kitron or the inhabitants of Nahalol. So the Canaanites dwelt among them and put them on, and they were put on the tribute. So now they kept some more of these worldly things and tried to make them their servants. But what happened is eventually they became leaven. Nor did Asher put out the inhabitants of Akko, the inhabitants of Sidon or of Alab, uh, Akzib. I should have my. And he's trying to read these things. Helba, <laughs> Afik, or Rehob. From New Jersey, yeah. So the Asher Asherites dwelt among the Canaanites and the inhabitants of the land, for they didn't drive them out. Nor did the Naphtali drive out the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh, or the inhabitants of Beth Anab. But they dwelt among the Canaanites, the inhabitants of the land. Nevertheless, the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh and Beth Anab were put on the tribute to them. They just kept, kept, kept keep bringing stuff in. Oh, we're just going to let them dwell with us. We're just going to keep it. God said, drive it out. How much stuff do you keep? Too much. How <laughs> much do we allow to remain in our life? That doesn't belong. That God said, that's got to go. I'm not trying to be legalistic. I'm not trying to be rigid. What I'm trying to do is give you some principles about walking in the victory and the promises of God. You know? That's what holiness is all about. It's not to bring ruin to your life and to dictate to your life. What it's about is about helping you to enter into the fullness of the promise of God. Because that's what he has for you. The fullness. God doesn't want to just have you have a glimpse and then go, ha, ah, tease. You've got to wait. You can't have it now. He says, I, I, I want to give it to you. He said, I've given you the land. Sure, he's given us the land. He's given it to us. God's not a man that he should lie. You already agreed with me on that. I've given it to you. Two things. 
Verse 22. Flip with me there. Chapter 1. So, this was so significant. I, I mean, I've read this story countless times, but, but I was asking for a word for Jaffa the Assembly of God. This is a common name in the assemblies, by the way, about what I'm about to show you here. Bethel, you recognize that name? Yeah. Lots of, lots of AG churches of Bethel. Okay, verse 22. And the house of Joseph also went up against Bethel, and the Lord was with them. So Joseph sent men to spy out Bethel. The name was formerly, of the city was formerly Luz. Now, I'm going to read to verse 26 in a minute. Bethel means what? Anyone remember? House of God. Do you know what the word Luz means? No. It means perversion wow. and deceit. The name of the city was formerly lust, perversion and deceit. This is important in this context because they allowed this stuff to remain. Perversion and deceit. You think it's not going to harm you. You're under perversion and deceit. How do I know that? Because look at the rest of the text. I'm not making this stuff up, sir. It's right here. And when the spies saw a man coming out of the city, they said to him, what city? Bethel, house of God. When they saw a man coming out of the city, they said to him, Please show us the entrance to the city. We'll show you mercy. Well, that's what you do in the house of God, right? You show mercy. Careful. So he showed them the entrance to the city, and they struck the city with the edge of the sword, but they let the man and his family go. And the man went to the land of the Hittites. He built the city, and his name is called... Luz. Oh, it returned deceit and perversion. Gets reestablished through the house of God. Yeah. Deceit wow. and perversion gets established again through the house of God because we allow it to remain. Do you, do you, are you with me? See, we think it's harmless. We don't think it's a problem. We, we try to put it on the tribute. We try to own it. We try to make it our servant. But it's, it's, it's a perversion. And we're deceived. And it gets established again in our life. Isn't that amazing? Right? So, verse 34. We're getting there. The Amorites forced the children of Dan into the mountains, for they would not allow them to come down to the valley. And the Amorites were determined to dwell in Mount Harry's, in Ajalon, and in Shelbian. Yet, when the strength of the house of Judah became greater, they were put under tribute. And the boundary went up from the Amorites, and it, it, it just ascent, uh, went from the ascent of Akrabim and Selah and upward. So there's this constant growing. I just wanted you to see this. Look at verse 3 of chapter 2. Therefore I said, I will not drive them out before you, but they shall be thorns in your side, and their gods shall be a snare to you. When we allow it to remain, it becomes a snare. Anything that we allow to remain becomes a snare. Again, I'm not making this up. It's here. Is anyone going to argue with me? It's in the Word, right? It's here. Your problem might be with the messenger, but it's not really the messenger. It's the message. This is the Word of the Lord. I asked for a word for you, for us. This is what God gave me. This is speaking to somebody's heart today. We need to get, get some things out of our life. It goes on from here. What happens when this snare remains? Go to verse 10. When all that generation had been gathered to their fathers, another generation arose after them who did not know the Lord nor the work which he had done for Israel. Oh. Yep. The whole generation didn't know the Lord. They called the, ver look in verse 5, I just want to point out the name. They called the name of that place Bohim. Bohim means weepers. They grieved over their condition. Read it in this total in verse 5. They sacrificed to the Lord, and when Joshua had dismissed the people of the, the children of Israel, they each went to his own inheritance to possess the land. But in verse 4 it says, The angel of the Lord spoke these words to all the children, and the people lifted up their voices and wept. We have a choice. We can weep over sin, or we can weep over our condition. Will we fast and mourn and repent? Or will we just cry over the state that we find ourselves in? Yep. One way or another, you're going to weep. 
because this stuff remains. It remains. And in verse 10 it says, And there arose after them a generation that knew not the Lord. See what happened in, in, our, in our country? Church, listen to me carefully. We live in the postmodern, post-Christian age. All of the labels, you know, people love to put on. But what's happening is there's a, a rising generation in America that knows not the Lord. That's right. We live in this day. This is why this is for us. I weep over the condition of the church. Do you weep with me? I weep over the form of this. In 2003 and 2004, when God gave me those six words, of which I'm focusing on obsession and possession, I mean obliteration and possession, I was weeping over the sin of my life. And because of that, God broke things off of my life and brought me to the places that I now walk at. I overseeing the New England region and, and, and favor everywhere I go. But it's because I wept over sin, not over my condition. I formally wept over my condition. There were things in my life that I knew had to go, and I just kept saying, God, I want them gone. And I tried so hard, but I, I, but I kept them in my life. I thought I could control them, but they really had to go. They really had to go. And when I wept over my sin, and not my condition, God could deliver the promise. God could deliver the promise. What are you weeping over today? Too many are weeping and they know not the Lord. For the sake of the kingdom, will you join me in weeping over the things we've allowed to remain? And ask God, God, give us the strength to remove them. Forgive us for keeping them in our life. God, we don't want this anymore. Listen, I want to say this to you, church. We need to arise. It's time for each of us individually in our own life to arise and to enter the land. And not just to enter the land, but to possess the land. To possess the promises. So maybe you're here today and you've sought to obey God the best you knew how, but you're not possessing the promises. They're just not something that, you, that, that, that feels tangible and real to you. I want to pray with you today. Maybe you're here today and this is the occasion. I want to ask you, how long will you waver, sir? How long will you neglect? It's time. It's past time. Because a generation is dying without knowing the Lord nor the deeds of our God. It's time. It's time. The good news is God's promises are yes and amen. That's what it says in 2 Corinthians 1.10. 120. No, 120. His promises are yes and amen. He can be trusted. His promises are yes and amen. God is able to accomplish His word. He's able. Isaiah 55, 11 says that His word accomplishes the purpose for which He sent it. It waters the earth. It brings forth life. And it returns to Him, not void, but in power. Will you take Him in His word? And will you do the things that He says to do? So I'm asking each of you to think about this. What word are you or do you need to stand on today? What word are you standing on, or what word do you need to stand on so you can possess the promises? I'm, I'm going to guess that this isn't the case, but I never presume when I come to a church. Maybe you've never specifically asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior. You've never trusted God for that promise. Maybe you've been waiting to possess the promise of eternal life, but you haven't found life in Him, life eternal and life abundant. I want to pray with you today. Never want people to leave having never made that decision or been confronted with that decision. Do you know Him? Do you know who He is? Have you entrusted yourself to Him? Maybe you've never possessed that promise, that, that abundant life that, as your own. I want to pray with you. Maybe God has said, as we quoted John 10.10 10 today, that He has come that you have life and have it more abundantly. Maybe you feel like, why am I in such broken condition all the time? Why am I in want all the time? Why do I not own the promise of abundance? I want to pray with you today so that you can end it. Maybe it's finances. Maybe it's healing. Maybe it's direction. Maybe it's relationship. Maybe it's fruit or calling or purpose. Maybe it's something else altogether that I haven't list, listed yet. But whatever it is, I want to, to encourage you. Let God's Word accomplish His purpose in your life. Let's agree with Him and enter into it. I want to pray 
for you today. But just as in the days of Israel that we've been looking about in Numbers and Deuteronomy and Joshua and Judges, we need to take steps. You may not be comfortable with this, you may not be familiar with this, but this is who I am, what God's given me to do today. The people couldn't stand on the bank and look at the promise. They were called to step out in faith, to cross the river, and to enter in for themselves. So if you're in need today of any of these things or something that I haven't listed, and you want to take possession of the promise of God, I just want you to come. Let's just come to the altar. I want to pray with you. Let's just come. And we have a choice. We can weep over our condition, or we can weep over sin. We can weep over the fact that we haven't done what God's asked us to do, or we can just mourn the fact that we're in the condition as a result of not obeying Him. But I just want to pray with you. Anybody else want to come before we pray? I want to pray with you today. God, right now, in the mighty name of Jesus. God, for these that have gathered here that have taken this step and said, God, I want to possess that which you have for me, God, would you honor the steps that they've taken? And God, not only honor the step, God, I say by your spirit, would you empower them? Would you empower them to drive out all that needs to go? God, let them keep nothing that doesn't belong to you. Let that be removed from their life, from the land that you're giving to them, Father. Remove it, Lord. Break it off, Father. Cause it to even be supernaturally removed from their life without the pain of the roots being uh, torn out of their heart, Father, whatever it may be. God, would you do it today in such a way, Father God, that you could be, Father God, exalted, that you could be honored, that you would be glorified, Father. And so that these that have come, Father God, may be able to begin to, to, to experience the fullness that you have for them. But God, not only do those things need to go, Father, now in the mighty name of Jesus, let this not be a moment where they just make mental assent, Father. Where they just make another decision in their head to believe you, but don't take any steps. Father, I pray that in the mighty name of Jesus, you break off fear, you break off doubt, you would break off discouragement, Father, you break off blinders, Father, in the name of Jesus, that, Father God, they may possess the land, they may fully enter into, dwell there, and possess the promises as yes and amen, because, God, you've established it so. God, I pray that they would believe you and walk in it fully, bring you honor and glory. God, you know the needs of each heart here. We could take the time to pray with each one, but God, I pray right now in the mighty name of Jesus you begin to just administer Holy Spirit. I'm just going to lay hands. Just administer Holy Spirit. Administer Holy Spirit. God, do it. Lord, search their heart, search their mind. Meet their needs. God, you know the fullness of what each one here needs from Fullness, God, fullness. Right now, the fullness of your promise experienced, Father. The fullness of your promise walked into. The fullness of your promise is entered into. Father, the fullness of your glory revealed. God, we want to see you high and lifted up. Yes, we want yes. the people around our yes, lives, yes. Father, to see what you have done. That, Lord, they would know the deeds of the God who is in the land. Yes. Father, we no longer want there to be a testimony in our generation that there knew, arose after them a generation that knew not the Lord. Father, healing, deliverance. Freedom, fullness, provision, Father yes. God, protection, peace. Lord, you know the need. Do it, Lord. Do it, God. Right. Do it, Lord. Each one. Jesus. Each one. In the name of Jesus. Father, I, I pray specifically even for this church that we're here today. So many of these that have gathered here and are in our guests as well. Father, thank you that we're able to gather together as one in Jesus. Thank you that you want to minister to us, Father. God, I'm praying for this church that we would enter in and possess the land. God, use this church in whatever fashion, capacity, and way that you desire so that there will arise a testimony, God. God, begin to work in our hearts today, right now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God, we yes. glorify you. We thank you. We praise you. God, minister to each one as they step back from this altar. We'll let the enemy plant seeds right, of doubt. Right, right. God, you've done it. They've stepped out in faith. God, you've done it. God, let not the enemy take away these seeds. 
right. That's right. Fullness in Amen. Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Fullness in Jesus' yes, Jesus. name. Cause us to not shrink the faith. Let not the circumstances Hold dictate the outfall any longer. God, we're believing you, God. Seal it. Seal it, Lord, in Jesus' name. Seal it, God. Seal it in the mighty name of Jesus. We glorify you. We thank you and praise you. God, you're good to us. You're a good, good father. And we thank you for who you are. We thank you for who you are. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.